Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today on the occasion of the International Day of Yoga. And this is a program organized by Ritambhara and Yoga Vahini to honor and celebrate the contribution of Sri TKB Deshikachar towards yoga and this is the start of a series of dialogues that we are initiating and thank you all for joining for this inaugural session today and we have with us four very senior students and teachers of Sri TK Videshika Chakar. Before I invite uh, Srimati Saraswati Vasudevan to introduce the program and the speakers, I would like to share the program outline for today and also some logistics information for all who have joined today. This is a 90 minutes session where each speaker, each of our guests will be speaking for about 15 minutes, sharing their experience. And following that, we will have a half an hour time for interaction and dialogue. The chat is disabled so that we are not disturbing uh, with messages in between the dialogue. But as you listen to the speakers, if you have any questions, um, you can message. It is enabled only to the host. So I will be able to receive the questions. And we will curate the questions to be taken up uh, in the last half an hour. So please feel free to uh, message them directly when you have any questions which you would like to take up during the interactive session. And we would like all of you to be fully present and uh, hopefully you will have an enriching time. I'm inviting Srimati Sarasudhi Vasudevan. She's a long time student of Sri TK Videshi Kachar and also the founder of Yoga Vahini based out of Chennai. Uh, Saras, I would like to invite you for the prayer and for the introduction. Thank you, Hari. A very warm welcome to everyone. I'm going to begin with a prayer. Tachayo Ravrani Mahe Gatoi Agnaya Gatoi Agnya Pataye Daivi Swastiras Tunaha Swaster Manu Shebhyaha Urdhvanji Gatu Bheshacham Shanno Astu Dvipade Shanchatoshpade Shante 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 Once again, a very warm welcome to our respected speakers for today, Sri Raghu Anantanarayana, Gary Krapsov, Sri Ram and Dr. Lata. And a very special welcome to all our senior teachers, students of Sri T. Krishnamacharya and Sri T. K. Vides Kachar, for part of the Ananta Yoga group who have also joined us today in the session. I can't see most of you, so I'm not calling out the names. And of course, a very, very happy and warm welcome to all of you who have joined us from different parts of the world. So it may be morning, afternoon, evening, or quite late in the evening as it is for Gary. Thank you for joining. It's a very special occasion. We have come together to celebrate the life and teachings of our dear teacher, Shruti K. Vides Kachar. Tomorrow is 21st of June. This is birth anniversary. Desikachar's definition of yoga that I have heard him say many times is that yoga is a relationship. 
true to that, it is this very special relationship that we had with all, our teacher that has brought many of us together in this very special endeavor. For me, it is a fruition of a dream I have cherished for many, many years to bring together the students of Krishnamacharya and his culture so that we can share their learning and experience with future generations of teachers, many who may not even have met these great teachers, but are seeking with great sincerity to carry forward the teachings. So as Hari mentioned, this is a joint initiative of Dambara Ashram and Yoga Vaidhi. So before I introduce our esteemed speakers for today, I will just share a brief introduction to Rutambara and Yoga Vahini for those of you who are new to the space. And I will also share the intention for our coming together. Rutambara is a community of seekers engaged in a quest for a satmic living. The members share a common concern for the current ecological, socio cultural, and political state of the world and find deep wisdom and hope in the teachings and practices of yoga as a way forward from these crises. I founded Yoga Vahini along with my husband 10 years ago. After spending close to 17 years at KYM, playing different roles, but primarily continuing to be a student of yoga and a student of this culture. Yoga Vahini can be described as a community of yoga practitioners, teachers, therapists, actively involved in study, in training, one-on-one -on -one therapy, and we are also beginning to do some work in the area of yoga research. We have our centers in Chennai and Hyderabad with students and teachers spread across India and the world. Our community is actively supported and nurtured by many of these senior teachers who continue to teach us and mentor us. So there is this beautiful feeling of so many generations of teachers and students coming together, like many tributaries coming together to join the river, to flow towards the ocean gathering momentum, carrying the precious teachings into the future. Today is the beginning of a very special monthly series of webinars on this topic, the yoga of basic culture. An extraordinary teacher who taught each student differently. And that's what I hear every student of basic culture say, including me, that's how I have felt. Like each one of us, are, our experience is very unique and different in the true spirit of Vini Yoga. We want to bring many of his senior students, not just senior students, but also students like me who were not very senior, into this dialoguing space to share what we have learned from them and how we want to take forward these teachings that we have received from them. Today is just a beginning, so you're going to have maybe 10, 12, 15 minutes with each of these beautiful teachers, but wait, there's more to come. You're going to have more time with all of them. Yeah, and mostly it will be, I think, the third Sunday of each month. The timing will be decided. And if it doesn't suit your timing, if you're in a different time zone, don't worry. We are going to record the, teach, the sessions and share it with you. Sometime in 2022, we are planning to have an international seminar to honor our Guru Parampara. So join us in this journey along with our teachers who carry the spirit and teachings of Shri Tekke with this teacher. I would now like to invite our first speaker. So the four teachers will be speaking in chronological order, maybe by age, but also by the number of years they have been acquainted with self. You all have received their bios, so I'm not going to read them or go through them. I'm going to share mostly from how I have experienced them and their teachings. To start with Sri Raghu Anantanarayan, the senior most in this group who met Desh Gachar in 1973. I started studying Yoga Sutra with Raghu in 2013. And I think that was a very significant turning point in my life as a person, as a teacher, and something drastically shifted for me. First, I have to say, Raghu helped me to listen better because I learned very soon sitting in his classes that if you don't listen well, you can't understand. The teachings are so deep and profound that you have to really keep your mind very, very quiet. And secondly, when you listen with a quiet mind, the very process of listening is so meditative that it just peels away several layers each time. I have experienced Raghu as a teacher who's both equally exacting and compassionate. Desikachar has always given me a gentle and sometimes not so gentle nudge to do and be more than what I think I can 
and Raghu holds that space for me and perhaps now many of us here. As senior mentors of Ratambara, he along with his wife Shashi, with such extraordinary level of commitment and passion, have been mentoring and supporting many of our young teachers and aspirants in their sacred quest for better way of living that is responsible and meaningful. So inviting Raghu to share what he has learned from this Gachar and how he has taken these teachings forward. Raghu. Yeah. Thanks, Saras. When you give all these introductions, no, we want, I wonder whom you're inviting, who you're speaking about. So thanks a lot. I hope I live up to all that you say, yeah? That'll be good to do. Yeah. So, um, yeah, <laughs> this is something that, you know, uh, we as a group have been planning for a long time. Um, we've had many meetings with Sri Ram. Uh, so we, Saras and I finally decided let's get on with it and let's start something instead of keeping on waiting. So that's why we are here. Um, and also as a lead up to this, we've been having some discussions on, you know, how to celebrate the life of Deshikachar and so on. And, uh, you know, whenever we've had these discussions, you get pictures of old times and you get, you know, remember things and all that. The strange thing is, Every time I try to recollect Deshikacha, the first picture that comes to me is walking with him on the streets between his home and KYM or dropping him or something. And I wondered why, you know, this is the picture that comes to me most often. And I'm speculating that it's because one of the most important things I think that he conveyed to us in the way he was is the utter simplicity and the humanness of the whole uh, process of, of being a teacher and so on. Right? There's no big shusha, there's nothing. I mean, wearing a bush shirt, wearing a dhoti, walking around. And therefore, there is also this the, the person comes through very strongly and, you know, not a Vesham. There's no, there's no artifice in the entire uh, interaction. And I think that is one of the most important gifts that he has given all of us. Uh, so that was the first things that came to my mind, apart from so many other interactions and uh, discussions and dialogues and things like that. The other thing that came to my mind is uh, how for many of us who were the first cohort of teachers at KYM, uh, the whole process might be as close to a Gurukula that we can get to in modern times. Because, you know, uh, Prabhakar, Lalita, uh, Lakshmi, so many of us, Mukundan, all of us would be there at the mandiram from about 7, 7.30 in the morning, almost till about 7, 7.30 in the evening. And there were various things that happened. And that's what was very interesting. Huh? Uh, apart from classes, uh, you know, Prabhakar, Mukundan and I had this habit of going across to a small tea shop around the corner and having bad chai and having discussions. I think there's a combination of bad chai and high level thinking that has a very, very interesting combination. Yeah. <clears throat> so, and also interestingly, many of us were, uh, were also politically uh, involved and charged because for example, uh, Girija uh, organized the first protest in Chennai uh, after the big DuPont, uh, the, the what's what's that place? Yeah, with the gas leak, no? After the gas leak, Bhopal tragedy and the gas leak, we organized a huge uh, procession and protest and things like that. 
so many of us were people who had come to deshkacha from very strong uh speaking of our own many of us had strong views about life and about you know all kinds of things and i think the most critical thing was the way he mentored us and uh taught us because looking back i don't think we were a very easy bunch of people to maybe hold together or to teach you know and uh, i can remember lots of escapades and so on with prabhakar and mukundan and all of us and so it was exciting times and also in many ways i think for each of us who were just getting into life i was 23 24 when i met him the mentoring that he gave us in a very subtle way made a huge huge difference yeah and uh, i think these are things that you know come to my mind first you know before even the teaching and so on and i think this is very important yeah and the the teaching itself happened in many ways and it was not just in the classroom because uh, there were lots of projects that deshkachar would come up with and uh, you know there was projects like for example i started illustrating the book that gary was involved in i think in some form so that was very interesting because i had to read through the whole thing have discussions with him and so on so there's a whole kind of learning that happens in the process of trying to do the right picture but it's tremendously interesting discussions and and dialogues that happen in that in that whole process right and then there were projects with arjun rajagopal and uh, tm srini dr tm srinivasan where we really went into at prabhaka was also part of that you know uh, we really went into trying to understand where will uh, yoga talk to uh, allopathy and these were very interesting discussions because there was never a, a yoga versus this or this versus that ever in the whole process and for me personally one of the most critical of these projects was when we had a discussion with uh, dr pulin garg from i am amdabad with whom at that time i was uh, learning uh, encounter group work and things like that and for about 3 months we had very interesting discussions and dialogues between pulin and uh, deshkachar on what is transformation of the mind and what are the psychological aspects of yoga and that has ended up being my uh, you know keystone in my life in a sense and i've been working with that uh, ever since and the yoga sutras the way deshkachar analyzed it was very very critical because what came up in those dialogues was that uh, the the yoga sutras are actually a set of key questions and spaces and directions for enquiry and the moment you take a, a sutra to be an end point statement it loses its quality and it loses its power so this i think was a profound uh, understanding and um, also you know this uh, i think a lot of the ways in which he he taught and the ways in which he dealt with us uh, was you know simultaneously like i said you know at one level it was very grounded and simple at the same time it was very challenging and uh, you know really blew your mind from time to time right and a lot of the discussions i've had in his one on one classes was not always on yoga or whatever he was uh, you know teaching jay krishna moti and i was also very interested and i would you know i was in a sense close to moti in certain ways so many discussions we had in class was actually uh, looking at life looking at you know where, where does krishna moti and his father's work where do they meet where do they not meet no the whole whole range of discussions and dialogues uh was what uh, i i remember and uh what is interesting for me is uh you know of late 
all the work that I've been able to do based on the study of uh, the Yoga Sutra with Deshikachar. Uh, Saras, Lata, me, and Yotna are having real fun. We teach about 30 or 50 odd people we are teaching now. Yeah, sutra by sutra. So I have to go back to all my notes and read it up. And then we have a chat every Thursday evening. I think we have a lot more fun and a lot more learning in that Tuesday evening chats than in the Thursday evening class. Right, Thursday evening class, we have to be a little serious and all that. But Tuesdays, we are it's a lot of fun. Yeah. And the other thing that I think has been very, very uh, uh, fulfilling for me is that the discussions that I started with, uh, with Pullen and Deshkachar, uh, we've been able to pull together. So Lata and I have been working with it uh, for almost a year or more. And Anita has helped us and uh, Sridharan and Jairamanan with us in that. So those discussions and dialogues that I've had with Deshika uh, Char, we put it together uh, and it will be coming out as a book quite soon. And that was very fulfilling because it was a half done kind of a thing after the whole dialogue that we had and it was very rich material. I don't know if uh, Gary, did Deshika Char give you a copy. I know that he, uh, he he gave the first manuscript to a few people, and then he came back and said it was worthwhile working on it. I thought you were one of them. Sonia Nelson was one me, of them. He did give me many, many pages, but it, yeah? it was a very rough draft. Very rough draft. Yeah, yeah. he wanted to draft. check it out. So he asked me to give it to him, and he checked it out with a few of you and said, yeah, go ahead. So we brought that to completion, Gary, and it's nice to meet up with you at this point of time, because thanks to you, we were able to take it forward in a sense. <laughs> yeah. So these these are broadly, you know, my recollections and uh, you know where I am today with the whole teaching. Yeah. So that's a good segue, Gary, to hand it over to you. Thank you, Raghu. Our there next we go. is Gary Krapsaw joining us from Oakland, USA, founder, director of the American Vini Yoga Institute. Gary met Deskachar just one year after Raghu in 1974. If you have not yet met this extraordinary teacher, please look up his website to know more about him and his work. I met Gary, I think, a few years ago at a meeting organized by the Yoga Alliance in Dallas. Later, I had the good fortune of listening to one of your very powerful talks on death and preparing oh. for dying. Very difficult topic that uh, you dealt with such ease, grace, and humor. A highly respected and sought after teacher in this tradition in America and internationally. It is wonderful to meet someone who bears his accomplishments so lightly with such grace. Gary is one of the very important teachers who brought the teachings of this tradition as received from Desika Chair to the West and has taken it to a different level through the American Vin Yoga Institute. We are curious, Gary, to know what you learned from Sir and how are you taking these teachings forward to your work? Can you please share? Thank, you. thank you so much and thank you all for being here. I have to say I got woken up in the early morning. Well, not exactly woke up, but Sri Ram called me and that was just like, it feels like it was a few days ago and found out about this. So I'm sincerely honored to, uh, to be here and to share with you. And, I, and I've know. been thinking, uh, what could I say that would be useful? And um, then I prepared some ideas. I didn't think like uh, TV or Raghu also didn't go into the details of the teaching, but more the process. So I thought maybe what I would do is organize some thoughts about sharing with you my own relationship with Sir and uh, some key uh, things that I got from him that sort of shaped my life, the way I, I look at myself and the world and how I have manifested my career through his teachings. Um, so I first met uh, Deskachar, I was an undergraduate student and I was on an India study group and that was back in, I remember arriving in Madras in September, 1974. 
And I was a relig uh, religious study student and had already been exposed to Patanjali. And actually, I was more interested in that and those teachings and Upa Upanishadic teachings, and particularly then asana practice. And uh, back then, I stayed in Madras about four months. Um, and even then, at 19, the extraordinary depth and clarity I felt in Deskachar's presence was really compelling. And then I was fortunate because in 1976, which was just about a year after I left, it was January 76, he came to the United States and led a one month intensive retreat. And I lived with him in the retreat center and studied with him every day and practiced. And then six months later, I graduated from college and just went back to Madras for two years. Uh, and that was 1976 when I came back. And it was there in Madras that I began the initial stages, by the way, of editing those lectures that he gave at that retreat, which were later published in the book, Religiousness and Yoga. And then that sort of got co-opted another story and became the heart of yoga. But that's, that was the original uh, series of lectures that Deskashar gave back in 1976. Um, and it was in that two year period that I was in Madras uh, that Deskachar said to me, you should study Western medicine. And of course, at that point, I had already applied and was accepted to a graduate program in religious studies. I was a student of religion. So I said, what do you mean? Why should I study Western medicine? And he said that in the future, I'd be bringing uh, yoga therapy into the context of Western healthcare. And then he added, by the way, you're too young to study religion, which I thought was interesting. Anyway, I did go on to do that graduate program, but I also began a self-directed study of anatomy and physiology and a little bit of pathology following his guidance. And I didn't really understand it then, but in retrospect, I can see how prophetic he really was because a large part of my professional career has been integrating yoga therapy into Western healthcare. I mean, just to give you an example, I've designed several yoga therapeutic interventions for many successful clinical trials and also played a big role in this uh, establishment of minimum standards for yoga therapist education uh, training programs for the International Association of Yoga Therapists. So, you know, this religious studies kit got involved with NIH, National Institutes of Health, and working with universities. And the big one was Aetna Insurance. Uh, we did a, a stress management program for one of the largest insurance companies in the world. Um, anyway, uh, from that period, I continued to return regularly to Madras uh, and continued to study with Deskachar regularly in Madras from 1974 when I met him till about 2001. So that's just you know, a little bit of chronology and history, but I'd like to share some of the important things that I learned that shaped my work. And I think one of the most important things was learning to see. One of the most extraordinary things about him was how his ability to see, see deeply, see things I didn't know he could see, see things and knew things about me that I never said. And, you know, I was just very impressed with that. As a young student and practitioner, he inspired me to look more deeply at myself and to look at myself at a multidimensional level. You know, the, the complexity of what it is to be a human being started opening my mind to that and teaching me to uncover what was going on for me, surface my own patterns, and then gave me tools that I could use to transform them. And then, you know, as he encouraged me to be a teacher and therapist, he taught me how to observe, understand, connect to people, to students at progressively deeper levels. So kind of one of the big takeaways for me is I felt like he transmitted to me a very small part of his great gift of observation. And that this gift of observation has been the foundation of my own growth as a human being, my own evolution, and as well, the cornerstone of my work with clients over all these decades. Another important thing that I got from him is helping me think clearly, and this is in the mirror of the reality of impermanence and end of life, but really helped me establish priorities for myself going forward. He told me very early that the mind sets the direction for the future. I was a religious studies student back then and when I first met TV, and I was interested in the, that's Raghu, right? I know Ms. TV. I was interested in the inner journey of yoga and even imagine myself, I, I mean, it's true, it seems silly now, but I imagine myself going off to, into, into the mountains as a renunciate and living like the ancients who inspired me. And that's gets hard to sort of laugh. And he said, you know, according to father, which is how he talked about his uh, Krishna Macharya, pravritti 
rather than nivriti is what's needed in this time. And so he reoriented me from my at least my at least my delusions of going off into the mountains as a renunciate and brought me back into the world. And he, he gave me, he taught me practical skills to help people and how to apply them. And he said to me that, you know, I remember, and actually Krishnamacharya said this, I had very little interaction with Krishnamacharya, but some. One of the things he said was stiti. And all he had to do was look at him, by the way, sitting at the top of those stairs. I remember sometimes arriving at the house and he was sitting there, Krishnamacharya, and I was afraid to go upstairs. But he was so stable, so stiti stability. He said, that's the first goal of yoga. And Deskachar helped me understand that stiti isn't just or CT is multidimensional. It's not just our structure, but it's also our physiology and our emotions and our thoughts and our behavior and in all of our relationships. And including, Deskachar pushed me to think clearly about how I was going to make a living. That'll come to in a moment. So this multidimensional way of thinking has also been a very important, even foundational uh, for my own personal and my professional work. So then it came to setting a direction for my future. And I remember then I was young. Many years I spent there were formative years because I met him when I was 19. So, and I was uncertain after I realized I wasn't going to the mountain. Then I said, well, what should I do? What should I do? And he shared with me his own choice as an, a young engineering graduate uh, to dedicate his life to yoga. And he didn't continue in that career as an engineer. So he sort of inspired me and supported me to help make my own choice. And actually it happened in 1977 while I was in Madras, he started assigning me students and I began to teach. He said, I should teach. Uh, and he said that if you don't teach, you have to do something else. So you should teach. And he told me something his father told him. He were, and I never forgot that he said, the teaching is for the student, it's not for the teacher. The teaching is about the student, it's not about the teacher. So he taught me that I wasn't teaching students to do yoga techniques or methods correctly, but that I was teaching students how to use the tools of yoga to understand themselves and to begin to initiate the process of their own transformation. And that my job was to see students meet, uh, see, to see the students' needs and interests, meet them where they were and provide for them the appropriate tools that were accessible to them to help them move towards uh, where they want to go. So um, that was, so, so I decided not to go to medical school and I completed my graduate degree in religious studies, including the study of Sanskrit. Uh, and then I continued my own study of Western healthcare following his guidance. And then I began because he told me to actually, I didn't start with the intention to teach. I just wanted to learn and disappear into the mountains, I thought. And he said, no, no, go back into the world. And he said, now it's time for you to teach yoga. And then he said, now it's time for you to train yoga teachers. And he said, now it's time for you to practice yoga therapy, you know, over the, the years. And as my career evolved, Deskashar, you know, really encouraged me. He also said, right. So I've got a couple of books that I published with Penguin. And that was, he never pushed me, but he made, what can I say, strong suggestions with perhaps the expect, expectation that I would follow them. And, and I did. And, and the other thing that I think is really important is he never left this point. He said the essential tool for your own growth and transformation is your ongoing commitment to personal practice. He said, that's the way that this path works. And it's really important also if you wanna be a teacher because, and I'm sure some of you have heard this quote from him, you can't give what you don't have. And so you need to practice. And, uh, and then he talked talk, talk to me and Raghu said something. I'm, I'm saying Raghu now because that's what they're calling you. Excuse me. Um, anyway, this idea of authenticity that you mentioned, like living authentically, uh, it, he taught me that I should be authentic, be myself. Don't put on a pretense, but maintain a balanced perspective about my, in my own mind and a balanced perspective about myself and others. Don't put on any airs. He talked about Brunty Darshana you know, the, and the teachers who become self-important, really m like more like dilute, self-deluded, I think is what he shared with me. And to always remember that teaching isn't about me. And in that regard, I remember he shared with me, it was the first time I heard the legend of Charaka and potentially being the same being. He said that from Charaka Samhita is a teaching, the physician should wear neutral clothing. 
So it's not about the teacher bringing attention to themselves. Uh, it's about serving the students. Um, and then he said also, you know, you can tell if your own practice is working or your students are practice is working because you're going to feel better. You're going to sleep better. It's very practical. You'll have more energy. You'll be less detached. You'll be less self-important. You'll be more tolerant of others, less judgmental of others. And he also said something very interesting, which is to me, he said that you can always tell how you're doing by how other people are reacting around you. He says, if your practice is working, the people around you will seem to be happier and feel better when they're with you, which was really interesting. Uh, so these teachings have been kind of like a compass for me, helping me navigate the complexity of my own personal and professional life while continuing that inner journey of yoga. I, I wanna say that to be honest, I was always jealous of TV and Mukundan and Prabhaka particularly because you guys were living there. I had to fly all the way back to the US and then fly all the way back. Uh, but anyway, that was my karma, obviously. So I just wanna say if, uh, maybe two more important ideas. One, the idea, I mean, what I felt with him was this, there's no better word, just intelligence. And then that intelligence applied to the yoga that he was teaching. Like intelligent application is just, you know, uh, just for me captures that for, with him. As a, a practitioner, teacher, therapist, trainer of teachers, and even now trainer of therapists, I think one of the greatest gifts I received from him is the understanding of the breadth and depth and full spectrum of these yoga practices. And then how to read people that I'm working with adapt the tools, apply them for each individual um, so that they work for them. It's an extraordinary gift. And I think one of the great gifts of this teaching lineage is the ability uh, to create what I call truly integrated practices that weave together all of these different tools into an elegant and integrated whole that's calibrated and adapted to the unique needs and interests of any student that uh, comes to us. And I think this is one of the main things that makes our, uh, our work, you, I would carefully use this word, uniquely transformational in this sea of silly yoga that's out there. Um, and that's whether it's used just in the context of a therapeutic need or to deepen that really true inner journey of yoga for transformation to freedom. And the last thing I, I think is important to say uh, is that he helped me understand Svadharma and my own path. Uh, you know, the last conversations that I had with Deskachar uh, were very, very important to me. I hadn't seen him in several years and he came to the United States. It was his last trip to the United States and we spent some time together. And he wanted me to know it was kind of funny for me at that point, because it had been so long since I had seen him. He wanted me to know that he was telling me that you're definitely older, old enough now to share with my students all the things that I had learned from my lifelong study of yoga and religion. He said, you're old now. So, <laughs> and he told me that I had done, and I was happy to hear it. He said, you've done good work in the US bringing these teachings uh, about yoga and yoga therapy. And uh, his last message was, now that you've done your own inner work, you must share these deeper teachings. And he said, in fact, that's your true Svadharma. So, you know, the, the, the work that I'm doing now is, is so different than the work I did in the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s. Um, and, and it's really from his blessing that I've had the self-confidence to begin to share it. And that was it, his last message. He just said, you must. And he, in fact, he said, why are you holding back? And, you know, he does sometimes say things without giving you assuming you know the context or maybe knowing you don't know the context. So I said, what do you mean? And that's what he was talking about. Anyway, so just looking back over the past, it's now already 47 years since I began to study with him. I feel a tremendous debt of gratitude. I feel deeply honored to be a part of this great lineage or tradition or sampradaya or guru parampara, however we call it. And I remain personally dedicated and committed to, to just sharing and transmitting what I've received. And uh, I'm very honored that you guys thought of me and uh, happy to be here. Thank you so much, Gary.
for many of us who are teaching actively now, much of what you shared so fundamental and beautiful reminders. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Shiram. Shiram lives between Germany and India, except I think the last one year he didn't travel to India during, due to the COVID situation. He has been visiting India every year and a very special teachers, teacher who we eagerly look forward to meet every year so that we can go to Kodekanu to study with him in his beautiful space. Shira met Desikachar in 1977 and studied for many years before he moved to Germany and continued his association learning and teaching with Desikachar for many more years. A very rare combination of great intensity and lightness of being is how I have experienced Sriram as a teacher. His asana pranayama classes are so powerful and meditative that you can experience what we call sharira samyama, prana samyama, and all that just by the way he instructs and pays attention to the very, very subtle details, at the same time keeping it very, very simple and accessible to all. When we want to understand and learn chanting for all of us, Shiram's chanting is a reference point. We feel very fortunate that Shiram has always been eager and willing to teach our students on a whole range of topics, from text study to studying the Yoga Sutras, chanting, asana, pranayama, yoga therapy. His teachings are so deep and profound that he offers with such humility and grace. Thank you, Shiram, for joining today, such uh, early time in the morning. Can you please share your experience of studying with this bachelor and how you are taking this forward with your life and work? Thanks, Sarasati. Yeah, I'm really happy. Also, thank you, TV, also for sort of initiating this because, uh, yeah, we've been talking about this since five, six years and really it's taken a sort of very concrete shape today, bringing it now an open, big open platform, lovely. And uh, yeah, and I hope it's going to continue in a regular, in a regular way. It'll be, re it'll be a great sort of a rendition of gratitude to Deshika Chasa. sir. Um, yeah, one thing which uh, TV already said in the beginning, which also is one of the key things which, uh, which impressed and made an influence on my life is uh, simplicity. Um, which is probably what TV you said, you know, where you, uh, the memories of his walking from home to KYM and back on the road, where one could see the simplicity also in the way he interacted with people on the streets, etc. So coming from, uh, one doesn't associate simplicity with, uh, with, uh, with sort of a, a good name, a sort of very great uh, uh, professional, uh, professional popularity, etc. And in, in the profession, etc. As youngster, as a youngster, I always thought, you know, they're big people, they have done a lot of things, they're very sort of uh, uh, big masters who you respect and simplicity is the last uh, quality I expected in any way. So I was amazed by this. And this remains for me a very, very important factor because I have experienced Deshika Chasa in um, different situations, initially as a, as a, as the sort of uh, teacher, who was teaching in the KYM and he was teaching me in group and private classes. And I also experienced him as the, as the director of KYM and me as a sort of employee. Of course, I was, a, I was a teacher there and I was teaching under his uh, guidance, but all the same, he did cre uh, think of KYM as a sort of institution and he ran it like an institution and he behaved himself also as a director, not only as a teacher of us students, in the sense, creating this institution was top priority for him. And one of the biggest agendas, so the way I sort of uh, got it and um, gathered it in my young uh, age. So I experienced him as a sort of, uh, as a sort of somebody who, whom I'm working for, as a sort of employ uh, an employer. And later, when I moved to Germany and I had the great opportunity of receiving him very frequently here, um, that was again a different level of relationship because I was not just a student of his, but also a sort of guest uh, a host and also in a certain sense a friend. And it was very interesting because he was opening my eyes to Europe as somebody who knew Europe from a very different uh, uh, 
angle. Also, I think a little bit influenced by his uh, very frequent and strong influences uh, uh, by Krishnamurti. He was very strongly influenced by Krishnamurti when he was in Europe. So I think the way Krishnamurti had impacted him in his stay in Europe had also impacted the way uh, he reacted to me in sense of the way he sort of guided me through being here. So I would even say he gave me some instructions on how to master life being here in Europe, although he was never living in Europe. So in this sense, he's uh, guided me through uh, all these phases. So as a, an employer, as a sort of director of KYM, dealing with an employee, me, a teacher there, he was an extremely strict person. But uh, otherwise, I really thought simplicity was something which sort of went through him in all the facets of my relationship towards him. And I'm amazed because it's this simplicity with which reflects in the way he de dealt with Yoga Sutra, he dealt with the breath, he dealt with uh, yoga, he dealt with um, so many other matters, and of course, the way he dressed and the way he appeared. So suddenly to see that one can be a big guru of a subject like yoga without having to wear any special clothes, without, have, without having any special language or something, but just being very normal, very authentic, very uh, sort of uh, just the way you are. No, no garments, no, uh, what you call disguises, not at all. So this simplicity has, uh, I think, something very fundamental about yoga because it's uh, his way of saying, this is how you achieve your sadharma, like what you were saying, Gary, in the sense of, you know, you don't differentiate between uh, this person and that person, and this is valuable and that's not valuable. Everything is the same to you. Just look at it in very, very simple eyes, like maybe a child would do, or like maybe a very a very naive person may even do it. But of course, he was everything apart from naive. He was a very sharp observe, observer and uh, also a very critical observer. And in that sense, um, I think this is something which has really helped me lose fears. See, I don't think I was uh, by nature a sort of strong-headed, uh, arrogant or proud person. That was not my main problem. It is one of, one of my problems. But my main problem was more fear and uh, being in awe of others who are greater and bigger and, and not being able to sort of come out. But the fact that being very simple, one can master life, that gave me the courage to sort of say, yes, you can. Even you can do it, Sriram. So in the sense, me, an extremely shy, extremely sort of a fearful person when it came to, you know, um, meeting and meeting big things, meeting bigger people, more powerful people, more rich people, and dealing with, with students and lead, dealing with so many people and being able to express oneself and being able to communicate and teach. All this, if you are kind of rooted in this idea that simplicity is not a hindrance, it's not a, what do you call, a, it's not something which is going to stop you from uh, coming or but it's going to help you. So that, I think, gave me the courage to become and be what I am. So I think in that way, he really, really helped me not only being a teacher, but also mastering my life living here in the West, which is, I mean, my wife is German. So mastering is, she has guided and helped me very much too. But it's not just about living in a foreign country, but living, even living in your own country and being there, one to master whatever situation. So that's something which profoundly influenced me, which belongs to the uh, realm of yoga, I would say, this idea of simplicity. The second idea which really uh, impressed me very much also was the fact that he talked a lot about breath. I have, uh, I, in my life, for my own personal life, my own personal health, and also the way I teach and the way I understand yoga, I think uh, breath is the essence. This is how I understand the texts too. And I don't, I can't imagine any yoga teacher of his time. I can't imagine anybody who would have really made me understand the value of breath so intensely. And I think, I mean, of course, Krishnamacharya has definitely contributed very much to all that Deshik, or all that Deshikaja has taught us. But I do think that Deshikaja, by this sort of simplification of asana practice, the simplification of dealing the way we deal with the breath, he's really taught us how we can take the breath so far that we can really build a life based upon breath, so to say. That the breath is really the alpha and the omega of life and of yoga practice, definitely. So this sort of uh, simplification, ad adaptation of the breath into the yoga practice 
is something which has enriched my life, personal life, and also the way, and I think the amount of people worldwide who have profited from yoga, they have profited because the breath has been so well incorporated by Deshika Chasa into yoga practice. So I think we should not forget this because the future of the world depends on breathing, on the breath, future of our, uh, of our health, the future of society too, in a certain sense, because the breath is that which sort of brings us together, which unites us, which is our sort of common factor. Uh, it is the, it's the same air out of which we all sus sustain our lives. So in that sense, breathing is coming together and uh, so I think Deshikacha has, in that sense, really taught us something very, very valuable. And finally, I must say, I'm not a born teacher. Like Gary was saying, he wanted to be a, uh, what do you call, he wanted to run away to the Himalayas. And I don't know, TV, what uh, your dreams about life were, but he wanted to be a teacher, really. But I was really, teaching was really not into one of my professional uh, aims or ambitions. But... Uh, I must say, Dehikacha forced me into this a little more heavily than the way Gary described it about himself. He really literally forced me into this profession and left me with no option. And I was not a very keen uh, starter into this profession. But I'm extremely glad because he made it very clear teaching means learning. So, you uh, like TV, your book, uh, uh, Learning Through Yoga. So, you teach. Not because you are a sort of hierarchically higher person with more knowledge, which you sort of give in that sense. That may be true in a certain sense, but it's also about growing, growing in the space of what we call vidya, yeah? where a teacher is there, student is there, the knowledge is there, and the sort of dialogue or the communication is there. So this teaching is a magic, which is, happens in a space in which the teacher plays a role. So teaching is a very, very beautiful subject. And I think Deshika Chah himself was a teacher who enormously enjoyed teaching. And I think it was a big uh, sort of, not only a cornerstone, it was one of the greatest joys he had meeting people, teaching and imparting, not to say, hey, I'm here, I'm a great teacher and I'm a well-known man, but just to say, this is beautiful to communicate as a person about knowledge. So these are the things which I think we can really take forward in the space of yoga. And I uh, yeah, look forward to many further meetings of the group here and other teachers of, uh, who have learned from Deshigacha and carrying this forward. Thanks, Saraswati. Thank, thanks, TV, And also thanks, uh, Hari, for initiating this. And of course, Gary, for joining us today. Thank you very much, Sriram. I think what comes across as all of you speak and also my personal experience, the simplicity of the teacher, something that we carry is so deep. So having said that, maybe we should just sit back and take three deep breaths. And then we go on to the next speaker, Dr. I think I needed this time more than any of you just to soak in, soak in everything with my breath. Thank you, everyone. And the last speaker for today is Dr. Lata Satish. Lata met Deskachar in 1982. Um, she was already a yoga practitioner and she was doing her thesis in psychology and she was doing her thesis on how yoga can help reduce blood pressure. So how I have experienced Dr. Lata is somebody who's so cool that just in the presence of her, your blood pressure can come down. What can I say about Lata? And I think uh, for me, she has been a very, very powerful influence. She's the one who drew me to yoga research. And uh, the many years that we have worked at Krishnamachari Yoga Mandiram to introduce systematic documentation. And it was her vision and clarity that helped put together so many important structures and processes in place. She started talking about qualitative research in yoga 20 years ago, and only now slowly the world is waking up to that possibility. We still struggle because very few yoga teachers are interested or inclined towards research. 
but with her guidance and support, she's been offering to all of our students at Yoga Vahini, building research competency. I'm confident we will be able to share our valuable work with more and more people in the world through systematic research. Lata, it's her humility and lightheartedness that's something that I really cherish and aspire for. I'm really grateful for your teachings, whether it is delving deep into the classical commentaries on the Yoga Sutra or understanding Western psychological perspectives in relation to yoga. Yoga therapy or yoga research, of course, or just a friend to talk to and clear my mind and get valuable advice. That has always been there. Thank you, Dr. Lata. And please, can you share your experience studying with this Gachar and how are you taking this forward? <laughs> Dear Saraswati, Raghu, and uh, Gary, Sri Ram, thank you very much uh, for giving space here. And uh, my blood pressure is uh, real up and down now. I'm stabilizing. Uh, <clears throat> Basically, I started in 1982. I was 23 years at that time and had come to Chennai from Bangalore. So therefore, the first bonding between me and Deshika Char was language Kannada. The moment I started Kannada, he started Kannada, we felt very close. The initial relationship with Sir is, I was not uh, like uh, giving a lot, like a teacher who was very fondly remembered and in the sense he is there as a friend to me. So it was very cordial. Then most of my learning in the initial stages were I was a fanatic fitness person, so I wanted to do a lot of postures. Sir would give the classes. Of course, Rahila was there, the Menaka Deshkachar and Sir. So it went. Then I had done my Sanskrit major, so I was very much interested in our classical literature also. Sankhya, Yoga, Bhagavad Gita, things like that. And Sir said, Tata, come, why don't you come to classes? I am having your Atta Yoga Pradipika in the evening. So that's how it started. Then somewhere in between the diploma course happened, everything became much more organized. So a structured way of learning happened where there was a personal practice, a learning of a text, and sir will just invite me, come to the class. I never went and asked him, what a, what a arrogance on my part. I never knew that there is a precious person who is teaching such a precious knowledge. All I had thought was fun. And I remember even today the beautiful chanting uh, Sri Ram and Sir used to do on the upstairs in uh, St. Mary's Road. And it attracted me to that. And I told him, Sir, you are doing such a good chanting. Why don't I learn? Then he put me on to Lalita. So it's like all this was something like a, a coalescing somewhere, no? like Lata, you have to be pushing towards it. Otherwise, you will never put an effort. So that is how the destiny made me to learn a lot in KYM under the umbrella of uh, Tishikacha's teaching. And I, I fondly remember the way he used to guide us in the therapy work, etc., supervising our courses, tell, telling us even if we did, if I do 100 different mistakes, he will definitely say, not that, ma, I think this would be better. Such a polite way of coercing me to do a course which is appropriate to the individual, not what is appropriate for me. So this is how I learned from him. It was like a supervised learning. And uh, sir had a lot of benevolence, very high level of kindness towards me. So my receiving of reprimands from him was relatively less than anybody else. And I thought it is because I am good. So anyway, all this realization happens over a period of time. And uh, today, at this point of time, for uh, so many years, three decades now, I feel that whatever punya I have done, that is why we have, I have received this knowledge and his tutelage. It was very easy and possible for us to go anywhere, anywhere else to learn yoga. It is not that only KYM is there, but there were so many other people also. But the attraction of it was so intense and the comprehensiveness of the teaching was touching your soul in a different way. Your interest in your traditional knowledge, conventional and the interest in research and interest in your therapy work, everything. And my own personal area of practice where everything was catered to so beautifully, then I had need not go and search anywhere for anything. And even today, that is the situation because there is no... There is no uh, 
like, uh, oh, I didn't know this. I should have done that. I should have done that. Probably swimming is the only thing I didn't do because sir asked me to go for swimming, but I couldn't go for that. So there are three influential things that uh, his presence made in my life. Uh, basically, I'm an academic person. I was more interested in uh, research and academics. So therefore, I pursued a lot of academics, like PhD and postdoctoral work and a lot of projects, things like that. But my, all my projects were geared towards yoga research because I had an interest in yoga. Now, one influence that he had, apart from all other things which Gary said and Raghu, and I agree with it, and even Sriram said, uh, one of the influential things was he, he made me understand what is the research orientation one should have with yoga, a specific type of uh, research that is essential for yoga. This used to come up in conversation between us whenever, like what Raghu said, no, when we are walking from his house to Harding, uh, to the KYM, he will be telling, sharing something. And I would make it a point to present some research papers or my own research work to him. And he will read it and then he will just ask, is this way? Is that you mean to say? Like that he would say. And he will question me, question me about the methodology of the modern research. And whenever he questions, I don't have an answer because he will question in relation to my practice experience and the teaching. So there was a lot of uh, the science, modern science taught me to find the normality, to find the common principle, to find the underlying mechanism. Sir's, uh, sir's way of questioning me or teaching was to find what is unique for the individual, what is the principles that are behind it, can you control it? Can you control everything? So this contrast is always there and it made me to respect his questioning and he exposed me to a lot of, lot of uh, various knowledge that are coming from across the world. Basically, my perimeter of knowledge was confined. Even today, it is confined to what is there, where I am. But still, he would share with me a lot of research that happens in Meninges Foundation or somewhere in USC, another thing, or some work done by different people in Western area. And he would bring that information and share it. Tata, it may interest you. Why don't you read and uh, something like that? Or if some important person comes from a different uh, part of the country or world, he would call me, Lata, why don't you come? This person has come, he's doing some research. Why don't you come and sit and chat? So this is how I was also, he, he told when I initially, when I wanted to do research on you, blood pressure and other thing, I told sir, I want an instrument of vision. He directed me to uh, team Srinivasan. So like that, he had that breadth of, okay, encouragement. And one of the moving experience for me was when I did my research on blood pressure for my PhD, we have to pay some amount to the institute when we have to collect the data there. It's a mandatory thing. So I completed the data work and everything. And then I know I have to pay money and I was on a stipend. So I went and asked sir, sir, I've completed the work. This is my thesis. Tell me how much I have to pay to give in. Nothing, nothing. That's all. Then I was really, because I had calculated, if he asked 5,000, I can give. If he asked for more than that, how will I do? Absolutely, completely no expectations from me for anything. So these are all many, many, many experiences. I don't want to say that. The one influence was my shift from a research which is normative based, group based, randomized based, to a shift to a research based on the process and the individualities and also unique experiences of the people are more valuable. He said, you are looking at yoga as a technology. Don't look at it as a technology. Look at it as a process and its influence. This was one important aspect. So that made me to integrate this uh, knowledge from Western psychology, as well as a knowledge from yoga, experiential knowledge of yoga. And I started trying to see what it is. Then he would always tell me to look for what is it that is changing? If you can identify that, and is it something that is exhaustively, I mean, permanently changing or temporarily changing? Are you able to do that, Lata, with your, all your instruments? He would ask me. I had no answer. I said, no, sir, I don't know. But temporarily, we think this has a change. Then he would say, okay. Then he said, how simple is your technique? How complex is human mind? You look at it and then let me know. 
And every time he would ask me to a question about the Western psychology, what do they think? What do you people say about it? What do you people say? I thought I was a master PhD in Western psychology. And at the same time, I, would, I have no answers for that. Even if I go and read the book and come back, he will put me a question which I can't answer. Then I realized there is something which is very, very valuable in this Yoga Sutra or valuable in your Indian psychology, which I have to really, really pour over. So that is what is first influence which Sir made. Uh, into, of course, apart from all other things which all of us commonly share, for me, that confidence about talking across any forum, anywhere in the world, on yoga research is really improved manifold because I, Sir, was questioning me. He was not questioning the methodology. He was not questioning it. He was questioning the outcome. Do you think it is the perfect outcome that the research has proved? So that made me say, no, it is temporary and I will have to pour over more. So today, if I'm able to talk across many, many, many uh, conferences where we will try to present and we will also accept the failure of our research and findings and other things, confidently it is because of Sir, because he told me the Prakriti is so vast, exhaustive, ever-changing complex, and what you are doing is only a momentary understand a, a sample of it. This is summary of our uh, this thing, and he always encouraged. Even if I make some mistake in my research, you will definitely encourage. How the, you do it and see how it will be, something like that. That is a pure beautiful orientation I had, a traditional teacher of yoga and a modern scientist with all of my equipments of uh, all the instruments of measurement. And he would, he, would, uh, he would ask some of the students who come to him from a Western country, Lata, you take him, he will be amenable for you to do the testing. So I will take, measure the blood pressure, measure 100 different things and in different, different postures and then take the results to him and he will say, oh, is it? It is very interesting. Oh, yes, that is why probably this quotation was given there. Like that he would say, it is a beautiful experience and that I will always share. So every time when I do a finding or a compilation, no, I will just think what he will think if he reads this, that is what I will do. It's a very unknown face of Sir, probably, and he was very, very scientific in his understanding, and he would always pick up something and uh, give me an example and say, what do you think about it? And that will really make me look for the answers, and that sharpened my way of objectively looking at the reality and also understand something behind that reality which will influence these outcomes. And many things I cannot control. When I re once I realized it, I became more and more humble in my research. And I said, no, I won't do research in such a way that I want to please somebody going to the billboard too soon or going for a publication too soon. And I won't do something which is not, not going to help in the long run. So this is what I learned from you. And today, at this point of time, my teaching work is very, very limited. I teach only of four or five students one-on-one. -on -one. Of course, I have joined you, your group in the Yoga Sutra, this thing. And uh, thanks for your invitation. And I also uh, do a lot of consultancy work where uh, people come to me to ask for uh, research work in yoga. And I try to put and integrate this concept of normality, control, and randomization principle. And also at the same time, I put the process of yoga, how it impacts, and I'm trying to bring the bridge a gap between these two so that at least some amount of this knowledge becomes documented in a more and more systematic manner so that we don't enter into a stream saying that yoga doesn't work here, yoga works here, yoga is perfect here. No, there is no conclusive evidence like that. So that is one area. Secondly, confidence in myself in terms of my personal practice. I have started valuing even the simplest, like what uh, uh, Sri Ram said, you know, the breathing or chanting or even in the practice of the simplest postures. His simplicity is not only for his personhood, including for his own practices. There are so many practices which were nothing but a simple practice of integrating some three, four components, which made a lot of impact on the outcomes. So I'm trying to hold on to those type of uh, practices. I either put it across to people 
people who reach out to me or i will try to do a practice and i am trying to systematically document those in my di diaries in my personal diaries so that helps a lot wherever whoever wants later they can take it and try to work on it number 1 2 third important aspect of confidence is with respect to his he gave me two Uh, words which really influence me. Lata, your name is. I say he asked me one day. Lata, what is your name? I said Lata is a creeper. You know what is creeper? He said. I said I don't know. He said, see this. He showed the creeper that was going up in the KVM. He said this is going up. You know, wherever it goes, it grows. I I hold on to it because for some of some of us his his words are Veda Vak Veda Vak. So wherever I go. i have to grow and i have to be a pleasant person for others so i like a creeper so i decided there is situations should not affect me situation should nurture and should nurture others also so that is one take home for me from his thing and there was one more conversation he made me he asked me to be managing trustee of kvyo i was never trained for that but still i accepted it i don't know what uh, destiny i asked him sir why did you make me to manage industry because i don't have an mba neither a ca or a llb or even in yoga i don't have any big uh, this thing he said lata you are approachable if he has perceived some good quality in somebody that is the essence of that person that is what i value in deshi culture with ragu also he told me one something about he is very intellectual ma if you can convince him of something i will really appreciate you he told me once ragu remember this <laughs> i can't convince something so i decided okay sir if i can't convince him at least i will listen to him that's what i told him that time nearly 30 years back and then he told me once you 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 listen to the chant me which i have done and shri ram have done that chanting the this thing you will understand how the chanting should be done that's all he told me so i know i had heard it and he knows how it is so this is how gary also i remember the, i have heard about all of you people through his through his words gary has said lata you want the real asana this thing you go through this particular technique that he has book he has brought in so even today you know in my mind when i remember gary you know it is in terms of his uh, his perfectionism with respect to certain types of practices so this is how he used to say and one of the thing he said i made you a managing trustee of kvm because you are approachable He didn't tell you no yoga sutra very well. He didn't tell you no beautifully the asana. He didn't tell you. There is a, some aspect of your personality he perceives, which each one of you, including Saraswati, every one of you, and all the people here, whoever has touched you, there there is some aspect of it. And that if you hold on to that for a moment, no, it gives you a sense of clarity. Initially, I refused it. I said, yeah, I'm approachable because I am a scapegoat that is available, so you could easily catch me. That's how I thought. Later, I realized that's a quality in me which can make somebody else comfortable. Why not? I don't have to teach Sirsha Sama. If I my presence makes somebody comfortable, let that be so. So this is how. i learned few 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 of this thing which gives me a lot of confidence about many thing and my life is generally quite happy and he told me about the swadharma also. every time whenever there was a family issue or anything no for him the first thing is it is your swadharma you have to do it never interfered with it i also never interfered with his family his swadharma he does i does my swadharma everything was okay as far as things are concerned so this is how even today when i remember him along with all of you the smritis are very pleasant and happy hundred times i have received a lot of uh, big bags from him and i have just taken it and happily kept it so i whenever i interact with some of my colleagues i really say yeah remember that day i got a nice calling from him ah yes thank you that is also a blessing take it in your stride and not to be bothered and no postpartum or anything enjoy the life and go ahead and i'm really happy so many people are teaching in this tradition so many have been very valuable teachers who are here and uh, <clears throat> saraswati and ragu are all doing such a beautiful work and very very happy to be along with you people thank you very much and with a joy i really welcome all the participants who have come very happily and something or the other you will pick up from each one of this presentation and i am going to listen to all of your presentation again on the recording thank you thank you dr latha and thank you 
everyone for bringing desi kachar so alive into this place we have about 15 minutes for any questions from the group and some of you would like to I mean if there are more questions and we may extend it by another 10 minutes possibly some of you may have to leave then you can leave and listen to the recording later yeah and over to hari thank you saras and thank you everyone it's so great and deeply evocative to listen to all these experiences and uh, very enriching um, what i'll do now is i have uh, prompted all our guests to unmute i will spotlight all of them so that everyone can see and um, if you have any questions please uh, post it in the chat uh, i can um, take it up and the teachers can respond to it okay so as we wait for the questions i might i have something which uh, evoked for me as i listened to uh, shriram sir talking about the breath um i think the your analogy of how breath is so common to us and in this in these times it's something that unites us i think that touched a chord with me and i was also struck by one series of dialogues that we are currently having in tambara on peace and sustainability through yoga mm-hmm. one uh, i mean any of the teachers can take it up on um, how do we uh, uh, look at the relevance of yoga in this tradition in terms of uh, creating that sense of harmony and sustainability in terms of our life and the way we look at the world because there are a lot of paradigms of world which is not really sustainable so at an individual level how could i look at this thing rakhu or shriram sir anybody can yeah well, i'll talk uh, oh, the go go ahead can <laughs> i was just going to say that one of the things that's so obvious in our approach to practice is how sustainable it is because the practice is based on an assessment of what's actually going on for us it's not about the practices it's always about the practitioner so what we want to do is through our practice is create as sustainable a practice as we can and that includes creating sustainable relationships and harmony in our relationships um that's a different piece than taking it out into the world. I remember I was going to the mountains out of really just studies guy, you know, some of those guys were like out there environment doing environmentalism and social activism. That's a different aspect, but I'll bet they have something to say about that. Yes, I think the idea that uh, it's not the technique or the technology like what uh, gary just now said and also lata satish's uh, lecture brought out that itself shows that uh, if we think of the individual or or society or the society of individuals or society of human beings as a point of reference and not what we have produced and what we have to sort of uh, improve etc if uh, that becomes more the center of our attention then probably we'll start rethinking also about society the way we conduct it and we we sort of uh, oh yeah respect the idea of sustainability so otherwise we just want to you know maintain status quo if we want to sort of have a lot of uh, have all that we can have so in sense of you know acquiring knowledge and whatever knowledge can give us sort of it becomes that becomes the center of the technology and the technology and what knowledge Uh, what technology's knowledge can give us that becomes the center of our attention and that's very disastrous for a sustainable future or sustainable society you know? whether yeah <coughs> i just want to add one small thing na uh, i remember a, a discussion or an interview or something like this where deshika chap was asked who is the right person to teach yoga mhm he said only a person who has an abiding concern for the condition of man ought to be teaching yoga mm-hmm. i think that's a very profound statement huh? mm-hmm. thank you uh yeah so we've been getting some questions uh 
So one, we have a question from Chinnasamy. Uh, this is to uh, Sri Ram. On how, could you please elaborate on the importance of breath in yoga practice? I think you did share. Uh, well, I, I, your breath is sort of whether you take uh, yoga sutra where sort of pranayama is a sort of uh, it's a sort of uh, dividing line between antaranga and bahiranga between the internal and external practices is a sort of uh, step towards from the external to the internal practice. Or if you take hatha yoga pradipika where it's almost mostly about breath, the entire textbook, uh, or at least the greatest part of it. And if you take so many Upanishads talking about yoga, they always talk about prana and breath. And so there's no question. See, it's, it's uh, I mean, we start living by breathing in the sense, you know, you, you scream or you breathe and then you breathe in and that's how we life begins. And we struggle for breath when we die and pass out when uh, we don't get air anymore or we can't breathe up, uh, breathe uh, anymore. So it is a sort of very deciding factor and it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful engagement with one's self. So I think yoga has taught, uh, it's one of the messages of yoga. So in that sense, it's really an essential calling of all human beings to be, to take interest in breath. Taking interest in breath is equivalent to sort of taking interest in life or taking charge of life, you know, taking charge of the breath. Yeah, in that sense, yeah. Thank you. Uh, yes. when, when Krishnamacharya was asked a question, no, mm -hmm. what is yoga? He said the first breath that a child takes is yoga. <laughs> so, and the other thing that uh, Krishnamacharya said is that the prana is the friend of Purusha, and that prana shakti flows from the karana sharira through the sukshma sharira and gives birth to the stula sharira. So it not only is the our life force, but it is what carries us back to source. So it's everything. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Maggie has a question on uh, how difficult or easy does it make it to study yoga in the way uh, Lata mentioned that research rigor uh, along with the demands of the modern science? How difficult or how easy? <laughs> yeah, see, there is a two, there are you, there are researchers physiologist, psychologist, or probably some other denomination of disciplines who do yoga research because they bring the knowledge from their domain and do the yoga research. Okay. Those are all like physiologists who, who know how to measure the physiological parameters and they are very well trained in the methodology and they, they try to subject the yoga practices to their disciplinary uh, parameters. That is one way of research which has been perpetuated for past three, four decades, like prior to 1980s. Then there is another group of people, yoga people who have practiced certain technique, who want to do research. They are uh, given an orientation to the methodology they reach. So what they do, they strive to fit the yoga practices to suit the research methodology <laughs> and its, uh, and its uh, uh, problems like uh, fixing a particular set of practices for a particular set of clinical condition, and they try to fit it to that. So this is the biggest problem that I had encountered. And I also started like that only because I was a psychologist and it was really easy for me to identify personality characteristic, identify a set of questionnaires. So I had the tools ready in my hand, a hammer. So therefore I started everything is an amenable yoga practice to test whether this yoga practice makes somebody better um, personality or better mood state, etc. So this is the same mistake. Real research part of it is I'm not throwing out the methodology of Western science, which is very, very essential. I'm not saying that. But at the same time, the practice of yoga is the first principle. Yoga, yogena, jnatavya. You have to understand the experientially the yoga, even if it is dirga, sukshma, breath. Like uh, Rashi Ram said, no, breath is central, like central part of my. The moment my breath becomes dirga, sukshma, I am in a state of yoga as far as pranayama is concerned. Pranayama is concerned. 
So that if you have experience, then you know what it is and then you will identify what are the parameters I'm going to understand and then you say whether it happens to Lata or does it happens to Yari or something happens to somebody else, Saraswati. And it may show a different uh, perspective in each person because each, each one of our are different. So there is a unique aspect which has to be respected. At the same time, a process aspect, aspect has to be respected. At the same time, there is something that you want to call out from that particular research. So the integration reads a personal practice and understanding, a reflective, tolerant uh, process of waiting for the results to emerge and then going to the billboard or publication. And the third important thing is understand the boundary of research from the greater community point of view. So when you go to the, I have done this very, very, uh, I mean, very shamefully, when I'm in a group of audience where everybody is very clear about the methodology, I will emphasize on the methodology and insert the experiences of yoga so beautifully, they will accept it. Or when I'm in the group of uh, people who are very yoga oriented, who don't understand the methodology, who holds the yoga is something like this, no? I present all the yoga experiences and then I say I have confirmed this through this, this, this methodology. This is a very, very balancing act you have to do because you have to survive in the world. If you are a PhD candidate or if you are working for an institute and other thing, you have to do that. But once you become very confident about what you are doing, you do not care for anything and you will do what you really like. So I, I have not answered your question. I have explained your question. Please spend some time on this and one day it will become very clear about what I am trying to say. This is a hopeful way of answering. <laughs> it, it, it needs a balancing act. Thank you, Lata. And I must also add that uh, under your guidance, many students and therapists, trainees in Yoga Vahini are getting guidance on how to conduct this kind of research. And I think recently, papers have also been published in international journals. Yes, yeah, yeah. See, this is what it is. In ancient time also, probably many of these sages from different schools of philosophy sat under a very beautiful mountain and retreat, discussed about their own proposition about uh, Purusha, Prakriti and other things, etc., etc. And then ultimately they said, okay, I'm going to emphasize on this, I'm going to present this. That's how our Sitra literature and things would have come. Same way the current thing, oh, is this the course appropriate for diabetic? Fine, discuss. It doesn't work that there will be more diabetic patients as it is. So if what it works, what it works is also is important. Important Where it doesn't work also is important. That is what I learned from sir. He told me, somebody responds, Lata, I understand. Why does somebody doesn't respond? Look at it. He asked me that question. So that is where we have to understand the behind. What is it that emerges manifest? What is not unmanifest? What is it that prevents it from manifesting? If you uncover that, that is the real uh, contribution that you do for your uh, yoga research. Then you will look for more techniques or probably more way of looking into it. That is what it is. Layers. And the modern research is only has touched the top layer of yoga research that is in terms of mood, well-being, and probably my blood pressure and to an extent my, my sense of have a physiological well-being. Maybe my digestion is better, I go, everything is okay. So that at the peripheral level, it has touched. The deeper layer of manifesting things comfortably requires a good practice and that's another area of research. Sorry, I won't take time, there may be more questions. Thank you, Lata. Uh, we have a question from Baxter and this is uh, evoked from all the sharings by all the teachers present today. So this uh, mm -hmm. question is, uh, my question comes from an observation which every teacher has shared that their experience of sir's encouragement and discipline seems a reflection of the teacher's own personality and what they needed to progress with. He seemed strict with some and gentle with others. Is this true? I would say he was strict in certain spaces and gentle in other spaces. And very sensitive to who you are. Okay, so it's, it's, it's slightly, it's not like strict and not strict or this and that. No? It's, a, it's a sensitivity to what will help you to grow. That's, that's been my experience of him. 
he uh, helped me understand the difference between false compassion and true compassion. Mm. You know, sometimes it was like going into the lion's den or into a fire. And, you know, my Spanish friend, you guys remember Joseph Barneta? Spanish, his Spanish English, he used to say caramel boom. Caramel's a sweet and boom is a stick. And he would work mm -hmm. with both. But you know, one thing that uh, I can't, uh, one, I, I just say it this way, that somebody said, he's so hard on some of you guys because he cares about you and he believes you can grow and he's doing what he feels is necessary to help you grow. So it's mixed. He was, he was basically both in the sense, you know, wherever there is a need, no, he used to be very good. Suppose I learned chanting, no, if I make a mistake in my chanting, no, he will not even pardon me. The look he used to go give is something that next day I will practice and come to the class. Suppose when I do, when I'm talking something about my health issue and he gives me my therapy class, he'll be very, very considerate. If I feel, sir, I feel I don't have time to do this. And I will say, okay, ma, let us look at it in a very more uh, appropriate way. And then he will alter. So it is in, with respect to the content of the teaching and the way we use it. Suppose if you violate certain types of moral, ethical, this thing, you know, I think he used to be very... I have done that many times. If I say that I will give a class to somebody at a particular time and I don't, I'm not able to come because I was happily doing my work in the university and I won't be able to come on time. He would just change the student to somebody else and uh, he will look at me like this and say, the student was waiting for 15 minutes, you were late. So I have transferred her to somebody else. I will take it because it's my error and I will take it. So I can't say he was very strict. Can't he wait for 15 minutes? I would have anyway come. I can say that. It is my personality, but his personality was you have to respect somebody's time and et cetera, et cetera. So there were many instances where I perceive it as a rule, but from his point of view, he had a dharma to hold on to. He had a certain institutional dharma or knowledge dharma, which he had to hold on to. Probably that's what it is. And uh, yeah, most of the time we always perceive our teacher as very strict. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes. I also had the same experience, actually, his being an extremely strict person when it came to the space of teaching, you know, because you as the teacher carry a responsibility and you're given a very tough job. If you're one minute late, you would be furious. If I, as a teacher, would be one minute late. If I was late as a student, one minute. That's okay, but if I was late as a teacher, it would be, it would be unpardonable. Yeah. And uh, in a sense, he has been uh, very, I mean, I've seen his sort of very, uh, very strict and uh, angry uh, side of his. But uh, since he had this extremely gentle and compassionate side to him, it's, uh, I would always, it was always compensated. It never, it, it never became an issue for me, you know, because it was not, it was in relationship to a subject where he felt it was extremely important to be strict but it was extremely important to stick to rules. Thank you uh, so much for that sharing. Uh, Kavita has a question on how Sir looked at what Western psychology sees as mental illness. Any insights uh, on his view or what uh, the, the teachers present here have learned from him? On how do you look at mental illness? See, there were... Uh... Two or three or you know actually quite a few students that I was teaching when I was in KYM who were referred by psychologists or psychotherapists right and um, uh, see one thing is there is there's no one standard fit in all this now so it's very difficult to answer this question like that but I think one of the things that uh, you know, I've noticed in Deshika Char and then the way he would ask one to teach was listening to that person to see where that person's integrity was still intact. Right? And he would not take the diagnosis very seriously. Right? So he would refer to this as saying you have to recreate the sense of Swatantrata in that person. 
So if I have to give you a quick answer, he saw any loss of swatantrata of the person as the fundamental issue in a psychological illness. Mm. Yeah. So creating, recreating the sense of swatantrata, recreating the sense that that person matters. Yeah, were very critical, and you know, I've even seen him. You know, when somebody says, uh, uh, you know, I'm ill, this that, nobody there to care for me, he'd say, no, don't worry, call me up anytime you want, I'm there for you. Whatever. So the the entire approach to me was sensing where that person's prana is still integrity has integrity and has a possibility to grow. And having sensed that, the rest of the diagnosis wasn't important. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know, Lata, you might have dealt with. Yeah. To one more, just adding what Gary you said. Also is, must have dealt with this. Very correct. Um, so that is one thing he would say. No, instead of let us say somebody had a depression, anxiety, or a schizophrenia, he would say the person is more important than the condition. Who the person who has the condition? That was his thing. And then if he uses the word, no, it is because they're referred by the student, not because he diagnosed. There is no diagnostic category in yoga in that sense. So he would not say. And he would find out what is the best that is still there in the individual. That is what uh, Raghu said. The best part of it is the pra prana is still there, breath is still there, and the physical structure is good. And there is a support in the family or no support in the family, depending upon that. He will always believe that yoga is a very good support system, number one. Now, one aspect he had about the Western uh, psychological management of the diseases, like mental diseases, was the drugs. He would say that if you can't handle the mind, you kill it by giving the drugs. That is what he had. I, I, that those words really mm -hmm. re re resonate in my mind. Mm -hmm. You can't handle the mind. You, you hit it with some medication, something like that. So our job is to work on that so that at least first we will remove the negative effect of those medication and then try to find out what is the state of mind and help the person through certain practices. So this is what he said. And he would say, uh, cloud, Lata, that cloud should pass. The cloud should pass and get out of that momentary clarity and that will give you what the person is there the true nature and then you hold on to the drag them out of them, drag them out. This is his understanding of the psychological. And for any person with a severe psychiatric condition, he would just call one of the teacher, put one particular practice, stay with him till he becomes okay and then only you leave. Don't give any other class to anybody you are with that person. I have done this sitting till 9.30 in the in late in the evening because the person has to feel comfortable and you won't go and do some dangerous work afterwards, something like that. This used to, and sometimes you would say, you have to provide some uh, uh, assistance through taking out and probably uh, help the person to get the trust. So this is his perspective about the person who is affected deeply at the mind level. Thank you, Lata. Um, we have two more questions. Do we have time? Are you okay to? So yeah, fine, good. For me, we have a question uh, from one of the participants. She says, this is such a lovely conversation and deeply moving to hear of the relationship between students and teachers. I am struggling recently with the abuse of that relationship, leading to distrust not only of teachers, but of yoga itself. How do we heal this or speak about this? Do you... <laughs> Yeah, we have to do a little bit of laughter and whatever. Yeah, see the the, the reality is this that um, when a student comes to a teacher, especially yoga, whatever, uh, there is an asymmetry in the relationship. Mm -hmm. Right, they come in with a certain sense of vulnerability. They come in with a certain sense of trust. Okay. Now, if I, as a teacher, have unresolved issues with respect to my own ability to handle discipline, uh, my own uh, raga dvesha processes, 
it's very easy to abuse that asymmetry uh, trick the person into very very uncompromise i mean very compromising situations and things like that and then use the power of my position to close up or shut up or do things like this okay and uh unfortunately uh, i don't think we can police this because there are so many so many instances of this happening all over it's happening not just in yoga but in many of these uh these kind of asymmetrical relationships and that's one of the big issues uh, of human kind itself na of how power is used not fundamentally to serve humanity but power is used to serve the self so if a yoga teacher is sitting there using his power and knowledge to serve himself everybody who comes in is a resource for himself right mm. so it's you know a teacher can say some things a teacher can try and impart this but it doesn't necessarily mean that a student has internalized this and then how do you find out right when you find out it's often too late and then if that teacher is not willing to be self reflective or honest they will carry on with their tricks and we see it quite often unfortunately we even know some people who do this and we are helpless in this context so the only thing i can advise for this uh, student is you know just because a few people are abusive yoga itself is not something to be given up yeah and you have to be watchful but unfortunately and today is difficult see earlier there was also these underlying things na that you don't submit to a teacher or whatever till you have studied the teacher so if you go to the upanishads it will tell you the teacher studied and stayed with the teacher for a year 3 years 4 years before the teaching started the student was as free to walk out of that relationship as the teacher was until that teaching started hmm. okay now we don't have these possibilities we meet a teacher for an hour half an hour here there something something and then whatever he presents to you is the only reality you know of that person right whereas if you're with that person through the day through so many things you really get a sense of who that human being is so that is very difficult today mm-hmm. it's a brilliant answer yeah for the situation yeah. yes sir so very lovely answer yeah it's a very difficult subject and i i sometimes think of one of these central one of these um, statements in bhagavad gita that uh, shraddha meaning trust or f- having faith which is also having faith and trust in a teacher can be sattvic but it, uh, it ought to be sattvic but it can be rajasic or tamasic sattva uh, tamasic shraddha so it's also our uh, commitment as a student or as a person who is giving faith in somebody or putting faith in somebody to move out of a tamasic faith or tamas uh, rajasic faith into a more satric faith it also means you know keeping the eyes open and uh, being more alert wherever, wherever we may put our faith otherwise it becomes blind faith and it's we make ourselves and even more respecting. vulnerable we are not respecting not respecting the teacher unnecessarily <laughs> yeah, okay i don't want to put it so bluntly but it's true you put yeah. human being also possibly yeah. sometimes and yeah yeah exactly it points yeah. to how important it is for us who are training teachers to to train a teacher to remember that their personal practice is essential mm-hmm. and that the teaching is not about or for them it's about and for the student 
So that's our responsibility, you know, today, and especially in the face of so much abuse. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, from the perspective of a student who has been abused, it should be a wake up call. But I agree with what TV said, not to throw out yoga, but just to show how difficult the journey is and to use a lot more discernment and uh, investigation before you uh, uh, open to receive teachings from someone who you feel is worthy of opening at that level to. It's a difficult situation. Thank you, everyone. Lata, ma'am? Lata, you're saying? Nothing. I agree with all of you, exactly. It's so very, very sensitive. At the same time, you have to have that clarity about where I am going, what I am going for. And at the same time, keep an open mind. Okay, am I becoming a problem for myself in this process? So if mm. that clarity should be. And the, most of the, as uh, Gary said, no, the teachers should have a lot of continuous reflection and education. Because once you become very complacent about my learning and I'm okay with everything, no, then that... Uh, my state of uh, that uh, I, what I do is right and I sacrosanct. That makes you vulnerable for this type of problem. So therefore, the teachers also should continuously reflect and see. Thank you. Yeah, but Lata, if a teacher is reflecting on how to trap the student, what can <laughs> you do? You can go on saying they should yeah, reflect, yeah. they should reflect, but they are also reflecting. What they're reflecting on is what's the next best trick I can use so that I don't get caught. Because it's a difficult issue, and these are <laughs> pathological people who have taken up the teaching. Yeah. Let's call it out clearly. It's a pathology, and these are pathological people who've taken up to teaching yoga and using it for self-aggrandizements of various kinds. There are various kinds of abuse happening, no, including monetary and so many kinds of things preying on the credulity of people, preying on the fears of people and so on. So it's, it's very difficult to police, very difficult to figure out when you start the process of learning from somebody. So there are so many differentials and so many asymmetries that can be used. It is pernicious, it is pathological. Unfortunately, we're not able to do much about it. Thank you, Raku. Uh, we'll take one last question in the interest of time. Uh, this is from Yale. So the question is, uh, one of the obstacles is that there is so much to learn and there's a fear of not knowing enough. How can one overcome this obstacle? Oh, very simple, yeah. I, I was one year into learning yoga. Okay. And because I am a I used to be a sports person. My body was not very flexible. It was a little stiff. My first four students that I was asked to teach by Deshkachar were all dancers. Okay? Mm -hmm. And for a dancer to put their nose between their, their knees is no problem. Right? So what Deshkachar told me at that time was, he said, look, what you are and who you are is more important than what you know. Right? So that's the presence. So that's the person you're taking into this place. Every encounter is an encounter for learning. Right? And the other thing he said, and also Krishnamacharya has said at one point is, he actually laughed in class when he said this. He said, you're seeing me now as an old man. Remember, I have not reached here without failing. Right? So you start from where you are, trust yourself, and keep learning. So Lata has to be a creeper who's constantly learning. I have to constantly learn. So, I mean, that, that's the only thing that Deshikacha taught us, huh? that is, you just keep on learning. But you don't set up this thing saying only if I have learned this much, I can do this or that. As you learn, whatever you can offer, you offer. Yeah, we always say that it's 
what's most important is the space you create between you and the people that you're working with and the tech technology and the knowledge will come but don't let the recognition of how much knowledge there is yet to learn obstacle you creating that space that's why your people are there they're there because of the space that they feel when they're with you and then for me the other side of it is it should be a joy that there's so much more to learn because there's, there's just so much that we can learn it's extraordinary but that should that shouldn't interfere with creating that space for those students that are coming to be with you. So, thank you so much for uh, such a lovely interaction and for answering all the questions. Um, I'm getting a lot of messages about how enriching this conversation has been for all those who have joined today, and uh, there are many more who are listening to this program live on Facebook right now. And so I would like to invite uh, Saraswati to conclude this session for today and also for the closing prayer. Deeply touched and inspired. I feel the responsibility of carrying forward these precious teachings. This field is so rich with so many wonderful teachers who continue to nurture and support us through this journey. I will end with a prayer reinforcing this intention for continuous learning. May we be protected, may we be nourished, may we enjoy this process of learning and growing together. May our learning bring strength, vitality, enthusiasm, and greater clarity. And let there be no blocks within and without that can separate us from receiving and offering. Sahana Babatu Sahana Bunaktu Sahavir Yankarabahai Tejas Vinavadhi Tamaste Maved Vishavahai Shante 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 Thank you, everyone. Thank you. We will continue. Yeah, thank you very much. <clears throat> and if you have a date, please mention it, your follow-up date. Sure. We, we do plan to hold this uh, every month, once in a month. I think uh, we will soon announce uh, those dates. And uh, we hope to learn and listen from many of the senior teachers uh, who have studied under sir going forward. Paras, would you like to add something? Shall we just say third Sunday of every month as we started now? And the timing we will just settle it. <laughs> we don't want to want Gary or people from the West Coast to stay awake through the night. So we'll figure out the time. So it has been a beautiful beginning and thank you all. Same Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Thank you all. Have a wonderful evening, day, wherever you are. For me, it's yeah. bedtime. <laughs> yeah, good, good night. Thanks Thank you. Everybody. My day has good started. Night. Thank you all. In a beautiful way, my day has started. Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs>